Subscribe to The Honest Critique for current affairs, movie, book, and product reviews. Also, make sure you press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the video series are solely those of the individuals and do not necessarily represent those of The Honest Critique and its employees. The following video contains strong language which may be offensive to some viewers. Viewer discretion advised. Hello and welcome to a very special episode we are recording today. I'm delighted to be joined by Enad Wilf, who is a former member of Knesset on behalf of the Labour Party, and she's the co-author of the book, The War of Return. Thank you so much, ma'am, for taking your time and speaking with us today. So before I go into the specifics, uh, our audience are mostly Indian, and we both have a British mandate territory after an, around 1947. Uh, but interestingly, India never had, or Pakistan as well, never had the British mandate problem of refugees. We did have for a certain period after independence. But when we look right now, the refugee problem in is bare minimum when we compare to the Palestinian problem actually during the same time. Could you uh, lay out for our audience what led to this problem and this continuation of the problem for so long? Certainly. And looking at India actually helps explain uh, the difference. Because if you're looking at the 20th century, uh, empires fall, right? The Habsburg, the Ottoman, uh, the British, ultimately the French. And when empires fall, new countries are established. And the process of imperial collapse and the establishment of new countries is always bloody. It's violent. Uh, new borders are delineated, and people flee across the borders. And that happens across Europe and Asia and in the Indian subcontinent and Africa and in the Middle East. So everywhere in the world, it was understood that the rise of these new states is essentially the end of the story. The empire is gone. You have the new states. You have the new borders. Typically, people fled or were expelled across these borders, typically going to the part of the border that was more ethnically similar to them. That's what's happening all over the world. And that's it. And uh, basically, tens of millions of people become refugees in this way. They flee from war. They flee their homes. They get expelled sometimes. But the message to all of them, to tens of millions of people, was this is tragic, you lost your home, it's very sad, but you move on. And that was the message for everybody. And the reason that the message was you move on was that it was understood that this is the only way to end the war. But the only exception are the Palestinians. What, happens that, what happened that the Palestinians were an exception? There's nothing exceptional in the establishment of a state after empires disappear. There's nothing special about war being fought over borders, over new state. The only thing that was unique to the Arab refugees that are now called Palestinians was that unlike all the other refugees in the world, they refused to resettle. And they, and they so refused to resettle that they actually made it their life's work. And why did they refuse to resettle? And that's important to understand because they understood that if they would resettle in the places to which they escaped in Gaza and the West Bank and Jordan and Syria and Lebanon, this means that the war is over. And they didn't want the war to be over because they fought the war. Uh, once the British left, they fought the war against the Jews having a state. They didn't want the Jews to have a state anywhere in the land. So they fought a war and they didn't succeed in preventing Israel from surviving that war. Israel, the state of Israel emerged, declared independence, and the Arabs failed to prevent Israel from declaring independence. And then they decided that they're still going to continue the war. It doesn't matter. Now, you know, that's why they only declared a ceasefire. It kind of shows you the value of ceasefires uh, from, you know, from the Arab side in our region. So from their perspective, the war continued. And one of the main ways to keep the war continuing was to make sure that no Arab refugee ever gets settled. 
That was fundamental. And what they did to that is they took the agency that was supposed to settle them. Uh, there was a temporary agency created. And why it was temporary? Because it was supposed to settle the refugees in three, four years, and that's it, and close down. But they actually hijacked that, that agency. They made sure that it was called UN, so UNRWA, because they wanted to send a message that the UN is responsible and they're not responsible. I mean, they just waged war. There was a completely unnecessary war. They could have had an Arab state next to a Jewish state, but they decided to fight for there not being a Jewish state. So they fought a war. They failed to achieve the goal of no Jewish state. But then they say, we're not responsible. It's only the UN. So they made sure it was called UNRWA. They made sure that it was giving an exception so that all refugees in the world were treated one way and the Palestinian refugees were treated another. And they made sure to keep it open. And this way, the Palestinians were able to hijack this uh, organization and make it into this Palestinian thing. So UNRWA now is a completely Palestinian agency employing Palestinians, run by Palestinians, for one purpose and one purpose only, which is to keep the War of 1948 open. You know, a few, um, I think a few months ago, there was, it was 75 years to the Indian subcontinent um, partition. And they had a big piece in the New York Times with Hindu and Muslim families talking about uh, families, you know, that went through two side on the other side of the borders that fled on the other side, and they talked about, you know, their memories. And I remember thinking, reading that, and thinking that's normal. You talk about your memories, but that's the end of it. And the Palestinian case, it wasn't like some sad story of memories. They've turned it into an ongoing seventy-five-year war, by which they refuse to settle by which every day they are committed to the state of Israel not existing. They're able to have the a kind of UN and Western legitimacy for this continuing war. And it's a tragedy. It's terrible. And this brings me uh, to a specific question about a uh, current crisis or in fact, this is the subject of conversation at this point of time because what we have seen in October 7. Uh, could you mention the role of UNRWA in shaping the Palestinian mindset, especially after what we've seen in October 7, particularly in schools? Uh, could you elaborate how it contributes to shaping the mindset and its impact on prospects for peace in the longer run? Certainly. Uh, UNRWA has all but made October 7 inevitable. Because UNRWA is essentially the womb that gave birth to a Palestinian nationalism. In the UNRWA schools, in the UNRWA camps, whether in Jordan and Syria and Lebanon and Gaza and the West Bank, was created a single Palestinian nationalism that was focused on one thing and one thing only, revenge, return, making sure that there's no Jewish state. Now, because this became the full, that was became actually what it meant to be a Palestinian. To be a Palestinian became to believe in return, in liberating Palestine from the river to the sea, and in denying the idea of the Jewish right to self-determination in the land. So everything became part of it, the school system. As soon as it became clear that UNRWA both was not settling anyone, but also you can't close it, it needed to do something, right? They needed to do something until the state of Israel will disappear. So what they started to do is to do education and healthcare and services, but the most important thing was education. And the entire education system became devoted to creating this destructive Palestinian nationalism that was focused on the idea of revenge and return and no Jewish state. And as a result, it became natural that the graduates of the UNRWA schools, which is, again, Palestinian schools, the graduates of these Palestinian nationalist schools became terrorists because imagine that every day you go to a school that has the letters UN on it, you know it gets money from America and from Europe, and you say, and you hear there that there was once a lost paradise of Palestine 
that was magical and it was stolen from you by the evil colonial white settler European crusaders and they stole it from you. And one day you will grow up and you will take it from them. Of course, you're going to grow up and the first person to hand you a gun and to tell you we're going to liberate Palestine, you're going to join them. So UNRWA gives rise to terrorist organizations decade after decade. So the perpetrators of the massacre of the Israeli athletes in the 1972 Munich Olympics, they were from the UNRWA schools. The perpetrators and planners, uh, the leaders of Hamas, uh, the those who planned the massacre of October 7th, they came from the UNRWA schools. They came from the UNRWA compounds that are mistakenly called refugee camps, but these are not refugees. Those are not camps. Those are just neighborhoods. So UNRWA is actually at the core of this militant Palestinian nationalism, and that's what it teaches. So the school system, the terrorism, it's all one thing. It's this whole Palestinian nationalist identity that is entirely focused on one thing, that the Jews will not have a state. It's a destructive nationalism rather than a constructive one. And moving on from this, I wanted to cover a little bit about another aspect of UNRWA. Uh, you suggest in one of the interviews that UNRWA's practices contribute to the inflation of refugee numbers, which yes. further hinders the peace process. Uh, could you... Tell us a little bit about that and what specific changes yes. or reforms do you believe are urgently needed to address this? Of course. So one of the ways that UNRWA supports this militant Palestinian nationalism and the idea that they are still refugees generation after generation is by inflating the numbers. How do they do that? The original war, there were about 700,000 Arab refugees. At the time, nobody calls them Palestinian. At the time, everyone understands that the word Palestine means Jewish. But as part of hijacking, they hijack UNRWA, they hijack the word Palestine. They begin to, they begin to base, as part of this perpetual refugeehood, they have several inflationary practices. The first one of is, of course, their generational. Their grandchildren, their great grandchildren, and by now we're into the fifth generation, are all called refugees. And it doesn't matter what their condition is. So uh, they can be a middle class lawyer born in Ramallah. They're 30 years old. They've never escaped war. They're living next to Ramallah, so they're clearly living in Palestine but they're called a refugee. So that's one way that you completely inflate the number and you make the word refugee meaningless. I mean, it doesn't mean anything anymore. We all imagine refugees as escaped war and they're living in tents and they're open to elements and they need immediate food. You don't think of refugees as 30-year-old lawyers living a middle-class life in Ramallah, but, but those are actually the Palestinians so-called so one way of inflating the books uh even though they're not really refugees anymore so 40 percent of the people who are called refugees by unra live in the west bank and gaza can we all agree that they're living in palestine they were born in palestine certainly by you know the thing that i find most amazing is that the palestinian authority will bring visitors to visit the areas that it controls to show them refugee camps in the Palestinian Authority. Now, this is the Pope, this is the Prince of Wales. They come and on their itinerary, it says that they're visiting Palestine. And I always thought, don't they ever ask, how can they be visiting Palestine, but be shown a refugee camp in Palestine? What exactly is going on? No one ever asks these questions. So the other way they inflate is basically by continuing to say that people are refugees, even though by any international standard, they're not. So people living in the West Bank and Gaza are now refugees. Another 40% live in Jordan. Jordan gave them citizenship. Nowhere in the world are you a citizen of a country, but also a refugee of another country. It just doesn't exist. If you become a citizen, certainly if you were born a citizen, you're not a refugee of another country. Another 20% are registered in Syria and Lebanon, but we know that most of them have left. UNRWA never takes anyone off the books. So many of them have left to Europe, to Australia, to America, and they got citizenship. My favorite refugee 
is the American citizen, multimillionaire, father of supermodels, Jean Al Hadid. He's still a refugee. He's still on the books of UNRWA in Syria as a refugee. Because UNRWA, unlike the real uh, refugee agency, UN High Commissioner for Refugees, UNRWA doesn't say, oh, we're so happy for you, Mohammed Khadid. You have citizenship of America. We're taking you off the books. No, they don't do that. So that's another way that they inflate the numbers. And this is why they say today that there are 5.9 million refugees. We started with 700,000 75 years ago. And now we have 5.9 million. It's insane. And especially uh, since you're arguing that the Palestinians' fundamental goal, even in the school program that they have taught, is the destruction of the Jewish state, how can even mm-hmm. international organizations and broad international community work potentially to change this perspective, especially when the perspective is destruction of other to live in their land? So, uh, first of all, they have to stop supporting it. That's the thing that I've been fighting for for so long. I've been spending so many years. It's not just a few terrorists. The entire organization, the entire Palestinian nationalism is constructed based on negation, not based on, oh, we want to build a state for ourselves. We actually want the Jews not to have a state. Look at what you're funding. This is all you're funding. And I always told them, If you're funding that, it will always go to war. How can you ever happen and expect anything constructive? As people in Gaza continue to say that they care more about destroying the Jewish state than building a state for themselves in Gaza, you are guaranteed that every dollar, every bag of cement that you're giving them will go towards turning Gaza into a war machine. And I would tell them, you feel very smug about yourselves sitting here in Brussels and Paris and D.C., and you think you're helping the poor Palestinians, I told them, you're just extending the war, and my people, I will be paying in blood for for your mistakes. Like, how crazy is that? Um, So the first thing they need to do is just to stop supporting it. A lot of people tell me, what, and if we stop supporting it, the next day the Palestinians will agree to live next to a Jewish state? And I say, no, it's not going to happen the next day. But one thing's for sure. If we continue doing what we've done so far, we can be sure that peace will never happen and the war continues. At least if we stop doing it, we at least have a chance. Uh, And it's interesting because I have something to ask you on this because if the potential consequences for Israel or for the Jews might be uh, the risk of becoming a minority within their state if they are forced to absorb a certain number of Palestinian refugees if mandated by UNRWA. Do you see this demographic challenge affecting Israel's identity and the right to self-determination in their own land? It's actually the opposite way around. It's the whole idea of keeping the Palestinian refugee open, of the whole idea of inflating the numbers, is precisely in order to send the message that there cannot be a Jewish state. And this idea of return of Palestinians settling in Israel, the numbers are such that it makes the Jews a minority in an Arab state. And that is exactly the Palestinian message, that the Jews cannot have a state where they're the majority, that the only acceptable way for Jews to live in the Middle East is as a minority controlled by the Arabs. That's the only acceptable way. So so that's actually the idea. And and UNRWA cannot force anything. UNRWA, again, UNRWA was hijacked by the Palestinians, but it cannot force Israel to commit suicide. That's what they want Israel to do, but it can't force Israel to do it. But that's that's exactly how they're thinking, by inflating the numbers, by keeping them going generation after generation. We will, you know, this is how we're going to make sure that the Jewish state will not exist. And this is also the key. A lot of people don't understand how is it that you have some Palestinian leaders who say they support a two-state solution. And then I come and say, they're still, you know, this will, it's not real. And they're like, what do you mean? They just said that they support a two-state solution. I'm like, Listen to what they're saying. Ask them about this right of return, the Palestinian refugees. If you ask them, they'll say, oh, no, that's sacred. That's holy. That belongs to every Palestinian perpetuity. Again, these are all fictions. There's no right of return. 
This is why Israel cannot be forced because you cannot force a sovereign country to open its borders to people that were never its citizens. Um, but they believe it exists. So when Palestinians tell you that they support a two-state solution and that the right of return is sacred and holy, the only two states they ever imagine is a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza and another Palestinian state to replace Israel through this mechanism of settling Palestinians in the Jewish state and making the Jews a minority. There was never in the last century, never, not a single moment when there was a Palestinian, lead, not even leadership, a group whose vision of peace for two states included one state that was Jewish. So how can the international community then address the UNRWA's influence on the Palestinian identity? Uh, is there any alternative would you like to propose for supporting the refugees without perpetuating a refugee mentality? Well, first by recognizing that they're not refugees, That's essentially the easiest thing. They're not refugees, they're just people. And for a long, long, long time now, they're not refugees, they don't need immediate relief. Um, in general, the one thing that I think we really need to stop believing in is this whole notion of the poor Palestinians constantly needing help. Because one thing that we've seen on October 7th is it required massive investment in infrastructure, right? We are now discovering that the tunnel infrastructure in Gaza is longer than the London Tube. It required billions of dollars in investments in labor. Uh, it required financial planning, economic planning, discipline, uh, strategy. It required a very perverse vision, but vision. So we need to understand that the Palestinians are not an incapable people. They're not some charity basket case. They're simply a people with terrible priorities. Their priority is for the Jews not to have a state. So they take all the money that the West is giving them, all the money that India is giving them, they're taking all the money Qatar is giving them, and they're using all that and their resources and their education. They're mobilizing all of that for the destructive cause of destroying the Jewish state. That's why they've never built anything. That's why they don't have a state. Because every time that people told them, you could have a state, but the Jews also got a state, they were like, no, absolutely not. Not good enough. Um, so the simplest thing, I know it's a shocking idea, is to simply tell the Palestinians, you're responsible for yourselves. You're not some charity basket case. You know, if you want help, we're willing to help you. But only after you tell us that your goal is no longer to destroy the Jewish state, that your goal is finally to build something for yourselves. If you're going to build something, we want to help you. But if you're going to focus on destroying what others have built, we're out of here. So I have a couple of last questions, actually. Uh... Mm -hmm. In one of the articles for Fathom Journal 2013, uh, around 11 years back, you advocated for an alternative approach, such as redirecting funds in the West Bank and Gaza to the uh, Palestinian Authority. Uh, could you elaborate on uh, specific practical steps or policies that could be implemented to address the refugee issue mm -hmm. and promote a more equitable solution? And do you think this is still yeah. relevant after the October 7 attacks? Uh, certainly, all my policies are based, again, on the simple understanding that they are not really refugees and that they need to take care of themselves. So what we said is, if you really want to give money to the Palestinians, again, I don't think it's nice to say, but you really want to give them money, then make sure that it doesn't go to building a negative, destructive Palestinian nationalism. So I said, give it to the Palestinian Authority to run the schools, but again, with the condition that the Palestinian Authority, too, ends its century-long war against the Jewish people. And and my, I mean, I suggested it, but I also suggested it with the knowledge that the Palestinian Authority would say no. I just thought it would be a good idea to tell them, take the money uh, to replace UNRWA. You're no longer refugees. They're going to, they're going to, of course, reject that because being a refugee is, as I said, they take all these visitors to see refugee camps. The same in Jordan. Told them, Jordan, by the way, most of the people who are called refugees, they're wealthy business people. They live all across Jordan. They're Jordanian citizens. Actually, almost none of the money of UNRWA goes into Jordan. So the only thing that needs to be done there is, Jordan, you want money? We're happy to give you money, but nobody who lives in Jordan is a refugee. Uh, Gaza, the same thing. You know, 
you want to build something for yourselves, we're help we're happy to help you, but not before you tell us that you finally got your priorities straight. Syria and Lebanon are an interesting case because those are the only places where you kind of have refugees. As I said, Gaza, West Bank, Leban uh, Jordan, they're not refugees. Syria and uh, Lebanon, so first, the first thing you need to do is find out how many Palestinians still live in Syria and Lebanon. As I said, most of them left. The second thing, once you know the numbers, and we estimate them at about 200, 300,000, most of them are not the original refugees, they're the descendants. So they're basically Arabs who were born in Lebanon and Syria, but were denied citizenship by Lebanon and Syria. And Lebanon also has an entire set of uh, really apartheid regime against the Palestinians, not allowing them to partake in the economy, you have a lot of restrictions. This is the only place where you can take the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, which is focused on finding solutions rather than on perpetuating the conflict, and tell them, look, you have this budget, within a few years, we want to make sure that no one is registered as a refugee anymore. Either get Lebanon and Syria to give them citizenship, find them a citizenship in another country, but that's it. And 200,000, 300,000, first of all, notice that's like 5% of the 5.9 million that UNRWA claims are refugees. So it's about 5%. It's a much smaller issue. And those are the kind of numbers that the UN High Commissioner for Refugees knows to deal with. And some certain people on the right, or right in the politics of Israel have suggested that we could repartitate and or move certain section of the refugees to other countries if they would want. Uh, do you feel that's a solution uh, remotely to do that? The reason that I'm not looking at it is that, um, first of all, I, I mean, if people want to leave, of course they should be allowed to leave. No one should be forced to stay. I think if anyone wants to leave and there's a country that wants to have them, sure. Um, my concern is that even if somebody leaves, but you still keep this whole lie of perpetual refugeehood, right? Just like Muhammad Khadid. Someone will go to America, but he will still be registered as a refugee in Gaza. We've only exported the conflict. We've solved nothing. So for me, the question is not where they are on the globe. The question is, do they understand that the war is over, that the Jewish state is here to stay? Because... For me, that's the key issue. And if they're going to fight me from, from Gaza or from, uh, you know, from uh, Paris or London, it's still not great. I, I want I want the conflict to actually be over. I want them to finally accept that they can live next to the Jewish state rather than instead of it. And the last thing that I want to ask you before I let you go is something which I've heard from one of your lectures that you've compared the current situation in uh, to the post war world war II situation efforts to transform yes. societies like nazi germany and imperial J japan yes uh, how does uh, you pr uh, this proposal applying to you could be applied to a similar radical vision for the transformation of the palestinian society uh, do you think uh, it could be de-radicalized uh, to be essentially to achieve long lasting peace in the region let me put it this way i see no other choice uh, the only other choice is to say, okay, perpetual war, we're going to build even higher walls, we're going to put more battalions, uh, and that's it. But if you actually want to bring, to bring the war to an end, rather than have more and more and more war, then that's the only way to do it. Now, a lot of people are telling me, look, but the Palestinians are not like Japan in this, they're not like, yes, there are some parallels, there are some differences. But the most important thing that I take from the Japanese case is this. First of all, that the transformation of an entire society that was murderous. I mean, what they did in, in Korea, in China, I mean, those are terrible atrocities. So you can take societies that committed some of the worst atrocities, of course, Nazi Germany, and you can transform them to societies that are going to be pillars of world peace, that are going to disavow war, so first of all, what I take from the post-World War II example in Japan and uh, Germany is that it is possible. If you have determination, if you have a radical vision, it is possible. Uh, the second thing that I take from it is the understanding that sometimes that's the only way forward. Uh, because a society is so mobilized for death, for terrorism, for atrocities, for war, 
that the only way that you end the war is by changing the entire society. So I see no other solution, actually. Well, that's all the question that I had. Uh, thank you so much for taking your time and speaking to us. Certainly. And um, I'm happy to be here. And